the Supreme Court of the United States. Did you know it's the only federal court specifically established by the U.S. Constitution? The Supreme Court is part of the judiciary branch, one of the three branches of government that the Constitution lays out to balance between legislative action and the rights of the individual. But what is the Supreme Court and how does it work? That's up next on this episode of Fact Bites. The Constitution called for a Supreme Court and a federal judiciary, but left it to Congress to figure out the specifics. Congress did so in the Judiciary Act of 1789. It was the first bill introduced by the new U.S. Senate, and Connecticut's Oliver Ellsworth, later to serve four years as Chief Justice, led the drafting in Congress. The Judiciary Act of 1789 created 13 district courts in principal cities, each with one judge, and three circuit courts to cover the other areas of the East middle and southern United States. We now have 94 district courts to cover the whole country. At the top of the food chain is the Supreme Court, often referred to as SCOTUS, or Supreme Court of the United States. According to the Supreme Court's own website, quote, the Constitution elaborated neither the exact powers and prerogatives of the Supreme Court nor the organization of the judicial branch as a whole. Thus, it was left to Congress and to the justices of the court through their decisions to develop the federal judiciary and a body of federal law. So basically, the Constitution paved the way for the court, and then Congress and the court spent the next few years figuring out what it was supposed to do. How did they make decisions? By looking at the language of the Constitution to determine what the role of the Supreme Court in the new American government should be. All right, and here's where we start to dig into the actual Constitution. Although Article 3 of the U.S. Constitution establishes the Supreme Court, it was Article 6 that defined what the court does. Article 6 establishes the Constitution as the supreme law of the land. Therefore, as the supreme court of the land, the justices are responsible for upholding the laws of the Constitution over everything else. This responsibility was upheld by one of the very first Supreme Court cases, Marbury v. Madison in 1803. The court's decision in this case allowed the Supreme Court to nullify any state legislation that was in violation of the Constitution and solidified their role as the court of judicial review. This means that they rule on legislative and executive actions, that's the other two branches of government, that could be in violation of the powers laid out for those branches in the Constitution. They are also a court of appeals, which means they can review cases that may violate a citizen's individual rights that are guaranteed by the Constitution. A good example of this dual role can be seen during the civil rights era. The landmark case, Brown v. Board of Education, ruled in 1954 that segregating schools was a violation of individual rights due to the fact that separate schools are inherently unequal. This actually overturned a ruling from an 1896 Supreme Court case, Plessy v. Ferguson, that declared segregation was okay under the guise of separate but equal accommodations. Although desegregation was federally mandated by the Brown decision, many states refused to comply. So in a follow-up case, Cooper v. Aaron in 1958, the Supreme Court ruled that state legislatures could not ignore or nullify the federal court decision to desegregate schools. All right, back to 1789. For the first chief justice, President George Washington picked John Jay, New York-born statesman and diplomat. The president weighed sectional jealousies, that's North versus South, and personal ability in selecting associate justices. John Blair of Virginia, William Cushing of Massachusetts, James Wilson of Pennsylvania, James Iredell of North Carolina, and John Rutledge of South Carolina. All had helped establish the Constitution. You may be thinking to yourself, but I thought there were nine Supreme Court justices? Yes, you were remembering middle school civics class correctly. Well, before a judiciary ruling in 1869, the number of justices who sat on the Supreme Court fluctuated, sometimes as high as 10 and as low as 5. Since 1869, though, it is fixed 
to nine justices. The law required the court to sit twice a year. It also required the justices to travel twice a year to distant parts of the country to preside over circuit courts. The justices complained, but it took Congress decades to change this part of the job description. The earliest sessions of the court were devoted to organizational proceedings. The first cases reached the Supreme Court during its second year, and the justices handed down their first opinion on August 3, 1791, in the case of West v. Barnes. Today, the Supreme Court is in Washington, D.C., but in the court's early years, that wasn't the case. Pun intended. The court's first session was held February 1st, 1790 in New York City. Philadelphia's Independence Hall served as home for the court for a brief session in 1791, and when the federal government relocated to Philadelphia, so did the court. In 1800, the federal government officially moved to Washington, D.C., however, initially the court didn't have anywhere to convene. Congress let them meet in the Capitol building, and that's pretty much where the justices remained until the 1900s. During their time in the Capitol, the court was often moved during construction and even spent time in the basement. Around 1912, William Howard Taft, who later became Chief Justice, started lobbying Congress for a permanent home for the Supreme Court. It took a decade, but Congress eventually agreed to fund the $10 million building, and construction for the Supreme Court's new home began in 1932. So who gets to serve on the court? New justices for the Supreme Court are nominated by the president and then confirmed by the U.S. Senate. The federal judiciary is the only branch of the government where voters do not have any direct approval of who serves on the court. Each federal judge, including the Supreme Court justices, must be confirmed by a Senate hearing. Only a select few get the opportunity to serve on the highest court in the United States. Since it was established, there have only been 17 chief justices and 102 associate justices. That's because once approved, Supreme Court justices serve for life. That is, they won't leave office unless they decide to retire or are impeached for criminal actions. Yes, a Supreme Court justice can be impeached, and it has actually happened 15 times, with eight being officially removed from office. This lifetime tenure, as well as a guaranteed salary that won't be changed during their time on the bench, are both laid out in the Constitution. The reason was to ensure that the Supreme Court justices would remain impartial judges, whose allegiance was to the law of the land, not to the whims of the majority. If you're not worried about gaining votes or keeping your paycheck, you're less likely to make decisions just to make your voting base happy and more likely to actually consider the implications of those decisions. Many justices have served until their death, including most recently Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Antonin Scalia, and former Chief Justice William Rehnquist. Over their 200-plus year history, the Supreme Court has heard many landmark cases. We've talked about Marbury v. Madison in 1803 and the civil rights cases in the 1950s. Here's a few more that guaranteed rights and occasionally caused major controversies. Miranda v. Arizona, 1966, ruled that police must inform suspects of their rights before questioning them. This case was heard after Ernesto Miranda was convicted for crimes that he confessed to the police, but without being told he had a right to both an attorney and to remain silent. That's where we get the Miranda rights that you can hear in pretty much every episode of Law and Order. Tinker v. Des Moines in 1969 ruled that students do not leave their rights at the schoolhouse door. This allowed the Tinker siblings to wear black armbands to protest the Vietnam War and students everywhere to use their First Amendment right for free speech at school. U.S. v. Nixon in 1974 ruled that the president is not above the law, forcing Nixon to hand over evidence in his impeachment trial for the Watergate scandal. For more on that case, you can check out our previous fact bite on impeachment. Texas v. Johnson in 1989 ruled that even offensive speech such as flag burning is protected by the First Amendment when Gregory Lee Johnson burned an American flag to protest the Reagan administration. Roe v. Wade in 1973 ruled that a woman's choice whether to have an abortion is protected by her right to privacy, guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. National Federation of Independent Business v. Sibelius in 2012 ruled that the Affordable Care Act requiring health insurance coverage for more Americans was not a violation of the Constitution since the act was declared tax and thus within the purview of the federal government to enforce. 
And Obergefell v. Hodges in 2015 ruled that the 14th Amendment also guarantees the right to marry, including same-sex marriages, requiring every state in the U.S. to legally recognize same-sex marriage. At that point, 13 states still had a ban against it. We hope this episode gives you a better understanding of the U.S. Supreme Court and its history. Please make sure to hit the like and subscribe button so you stay up to date when we release new episodes of Fact Bites. Oh, and just a quick reminder that if you hit the bell, you'll actually get, like, an email when we do new episodes. So hit the bell, too. Remember to hit the bell for notifications. All right, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.